a woman who's changing the world by trying to make it better for victims of abuse. Plus, a mother confronts the man who killed her daughter. And then, a power worker falls off the lines and wakes up in heaven. Everything was just so white, whiter than white. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. For today's top stories, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Gordon, for many people on the Atlantic coast, Labor Day weekend was wet, windy, and dangerous thanks to the heavy rain and strong winds from the powerful storm Ermine. And it may strike again in the Northeast. Dale Hurd has the story. Former Hurricane Hermine killed two people after coming ashore in Florida, then continued up the coast and battered the Northeast. You can feel it in the house when the waves hit the piling shake. Now a post-tropical cyclone out in the Atlantic, the former hurricane is churning up dangerous waves and potentially life-threatening rip currents. Lifeguards have, have been very, very careful with um, keeping people out of the water. Governors along the eastern seaboard have taken emergency precautions. New York City beaches are shut down for the second day in a row. New Jersey has declared a state of emergency in some coastal counties. Crews have been working through the weekend building up sand dunes to keep the storm surge at bay. Absolutely ferocious. Hermine slammed into Florida Friday as a Category 1 hurricane with 80 mile per hour winds, knocking down trees and power lines and causing death. I look out my window and we have an ocean on our front porch. Florida Governor Rick Scott spent Sunday morning meeting with emergency managers in flooded Pasco County, where rising waters forced several evacuations. There is a lot of water that still has to move through our county, and, and so we're not out of the woods yet. After it left Florida, Hermine delivered high winds and torrential rain to Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia, leaving some entire neighborhoods underwater and creating this giant sinkhole in Wilmington, North Carolina. Hermine remains a powerful storm sitting off the coast of New England like a bad guest who won't leave. Officials are urging people to use caution and stay out of the water as the threat of potentially deadly rip currents remains extremely high. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Labor Day marks the traditional start of the presidential election campaign, and Donald Trump kept up his outreach to minority voters by visiting a, a church in Detroit in order, as he said, to learn. He promised to fix what he called many wrongs facing African Americans. Trump swayed to songs of worship, read scripture, and donned a Jewish prayer shawl during Saturday's visit to Great Faith Ministries International. I am here to listen to you. I fully understand that the African-American community has suffered from discrimination and that there are many wrongs that must still be made right. Trump praised the black church as the conscience of our country, and he said the nation needs a civil rights agenda for our time. Another missile test by North Korea. The communist nation fired three suspected medium range missiles today. They traveled about 620 miles and landed near Japan. It was an apparent show of force tied to the G20 economic summit going on in China now, according to officials in Seoul, South Korea. North Korea has carried out a series of missile tests recently with increasing range. The tests have been part of a program that aims to eventually build long-range nuclear missiles capable of reaching the United States mainland. In late August, the UN Security Council strongly condemned four North Korean ballistic missile launches in July and August. It called them grave violations of a ban on all ballistic missile activity. Here at home, a much more positive story. A church in Virginia Beach, Virginia is both growing and giving back. We're talking about produce, homegrown fruits and vegetables. Here's a look at this healthy outreach. Gardening is much more than a pastime at Nimmo United Methodist Church. The large flourishing gardens on the church property are the products of hard work and prayer. Garden coordinator Melody Jeffrey has prayed very specific prayers. 
help us get volunteers, help us have the things we need, help me with knowledge and discernment because, like I said, I didn't know gardening and I was a little bit afraid. Melody says God has been faithful. The bounty in this garden known as the Victory Garden includes vegetables, fruits, and herbs. We provide the food. It all goes out to food pantries and we realized they just wanted the basics. We do really basic things that people could eat without cooking or they could simply prepare. Melody and her volunteers garden organically, meaning they don't use pesticides or herbicides other than natural ones. I really enjoy it. I love being outdoors and I also love giving back. So it's been a nice mix for me. In addition to providing food for local pantries, they also serve the community in monthly field to fork dinners. Lisa Renz is the co-chairman of missions and outreach for the church. All the meals are very healthy. They taste fabulous. And we have had people not just from our own church, but from around the community come out and eat. And so we're able to share dinner with a wide array of people we otherwise would not have met. It's probably two thirds community, one third the church. Um, because we're not billing it as a church dinner and we charge um, just to cover our costs. But by making it that way, people are inviting their friends. The Victory Garden isn't the only outreach here. The church also has this. It's called a community garden where families have plots to grow their own food. We eat beans like all day long. <laughs> <laughs> the beans just grow and grow and grow, um, and now the tomatoes are starting to take off, so we're getting lots. Garden volunteer Fred Osterreich planted a cross near the gardens. And this is why we have the, the cross out there to signify, you know, this is, this is where it all started. This is how we do things, and it comes from the cross. My faith in Jesus really motivates what I'm doing here. Growing and giving. The mission here is simple. There you go. You put those in the basket and rewarding for both givers and receivers. What a neat ministry there. Well, those are today's top stories from CBN News. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. People Magazine named her one of 15 women changing the world. Erin Marin is on a mission to protect children from being sexually abused. The Illinois woman is taking her fight to all 50 states and then beyond. Mark Martin has her courageous story. With a bubbly baby girl, supportive husband, and infectious personality, you'd never guess Erin Marin has endured tragic, unimaginable acts. This vibrant 30-year-old is a survivor of sexual abuse. She says it started when she was just six years old at her first sleepover. Aaron says her best friend's uncle sexually abused her that night. I could see his face because I was sleeping above the bedroom window and the street light shined in. So I could see this man's face looking at me, telling me to be quiet. So of course, I've got this authority figure standing over me. I did get quiet. And for the first time, he sexually abused me. Aaron never told anyone. And she says until she turned eight and a half, the man repeatedly sexually abused her even brutally raping her just weeks shy of her seventh birthday. She says he continued to threaten her to keep quiet, and she complied. He told me that if I told anybody, my parents wouldn't believe me, he'd come get me. As a matter of fact, he told me my parents wouldn't love me anymore. He brainwashed me. No one had been educating me. You don't keep these kinds of secrets. Even after she and her family moved to a new neighborhood, sexual abuse continued. This time, the perpetrator was an older cousin someone she had viewed as a brother figure. It's often people you trust with your kids that you think would never do something like this. He told me, just like in the past, by this other perpetrator, Aaron, this is our little secret. No one will believe you. Aaron wrote about her despair in this childhood diary. January 7th, 1998, I was 12 years old. I'm 2.40 a.m. Dear God, please help me. I can't take this much more. I can barely sleep anymore. The nightmares have me up, tossing and turning in my sleep. Erin finally broke her silence when her younger sister told her that she too was being sexually abused by the same cousin. The two told their parents who believed them 100%. The next step was telling their story to a forensic investigator here, the Children's Advocacy Center. There are more than 900 of these nonprofit centers around the country. It's extremely important that centers like this exist, that kids have a safe place to come to talk, that families get the support they need to heal from these um, traumas that they've experienced. The room where Erin found her voice has a two-way mirror. As she shared her story with a trained therapist, 
Behind that mirror, investigators listen, collecting information to build a case against a perpetrator. And I walked out of this um, center, you know, like I said, feeling this burden just lifted from my shoulders and knowing I had the support that for the longest time that I felt so alone that nobody understood. Erin says her cousin confessed to the crime, was sentenced to seven years probation and put in the sex offender treatment program instead of receiving jail time. However, Erin's early childhood abuser was never prosecuted. What Erin and her sister went through is by no means isolated. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused by their 18th birthday. Erin eventually went on to become a social worker at a counseling agency. But God had different plans for her to help children and teens on a national and international level. He used her childhood diary to spark a new idea. And it was reading this passage that struck me and I said, they don't teach us that in school. They teach us tornado drills, fire drills, bus drills, bully intervention, internet safety. I still have my dare card that taught us the eight ways to say no to drugs, but I didn't know how to say no to my abuse or tell somebody. And so this was on my heart for a while. And then one night in the middle of the night, I heard God speak to me. I was clearly hearing him speak to me saying, Aaron, you need to quit your job. This is not where you belong. You need to go after this law that has been on your heart for many months now. Aaron's law was born. The law requires age appropriate personal body safety and sexual abuse prevention curriculum for pre-kindergarten through 12th grade students in public schools. It educates kids on safe touch, unsafe touch, safe secrets, unsafe secrets, how to get away and tell. Aaron is on a mission to find either a state senator or representative in each state to sponsor the bill, who then drafts it and introduces it to lawmakers for an eventual vote. Aaron's law is spreading like wildfire, even drawing the attention of celebrities like Oprah and Katie Couric and magazines like People and Glamour. I feel so blessed um, with where my life is today. Yes, what happened was tragic, but I have reached this triumph of you know, putting a face and voice on this. And I couldn't have done it without, you know, the Lord guiding me. And that's why, you know, I have so much confidence. I have so much confidence that I will get this passed in every state um, because the Lord is right there with me. It's a legacy she'll leave for her baby girl and millions of other children who, because of a law, will be protected from the grip of sexual abuse. Mark Martin, CBN News, Cook County, Illinois. Well, if you want to help sponsor a law in your state, Aaron's Law, you can find out more information about Aaron's mission to protect children from sexual abuse by just going to CBNNews.com. Terry? Well, up next, Sharika Adams was about to become a mother when the unthinkable happened. Mama one, I've been shot. You've been shot. Where are you at, me? I'm eight months pregnant. How'd this happen? Stay tuned for an incredible story of forgiveness after this. On November 16, 1999, Sandra Adams was looking forward to the birth of her grandchild. Her daughter, Sharika, was eight months pregnant and also expecting a marriage proposal from her boyfriend. Well, that proposal never came. And instead, Sharika was shot. The summer, I believe, of 1997, my daughter called me to say she'd met this fantastic guy, Ray Carruth, who was playing for the Carolina Panthers at the time. She was just instantly infatuated with him. He had a great smile and just outgoing, fun-loving. I had no reason not to like him. But he was not the person that she thought he was. He was more of a, a ladies' man. By the time that she found out she was pregnant, their relationship was very tumultuous. He was almost like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of guy. He seemed to be really excited at first, but then he told her he didn't want to start having a lot of children illegitimately. He already had one son, and he wasn't there for him. 
Sharika always wanted to be a mom. She was not going to have an abortion. November 16th, this was gonna be their first official date as a couple again. She really thought that the relationship was taking a step forward. She even had in the back of her mind, I think, Mom, he might even ask me to marry him tonight. Mama, one I've been shot. You've been shot. Where are you at, me? I'm eight months pregnant. How'd this happen? Uh, I was following my baby daddy, Ray with my boyfriend. Where's he, he at? He was in the car in front of me, and he closed down, and somebody pulled up and said, I'm in this. And then where'd he go? He just won't have, I think he did it. I don't know what to think of. Okay. I don't remember getting dressed. I don't remember driving. I just remember showing up and being at the hospital. When I got there and Ray wasn't there, my, my initial reaction was, and he doesn't know. I'm calling him and paging him, telling him Sharika's been shot, she's in surgery, they're taking the baby by cesarean section. I mean, you need to get here as quickly as you can. And I just remember waiting hours and when he did show up, he showed up with another couple and another woman. And my heart just sank. Not once did he ask me how she was doing. Not once did he ask me, did my son make it or how is my son? I remember that long walk to the neonatal unit and when I saw Chancellor, oh, he was just the most precious sight. He had all the little tubes all over him and everything, but he was just beautiful. The doctors gave us such a grim prognosis with the cerebral palsy that every part of his brain had been affected. All along, I knew I held on to my faith that God is in control of this. Who shot 24-year-old Sharika Adams while she was driving along Ray Road in Southeast Charlotte around 12.30 Tuesday morning? Police say she was traveling toward town when four shots were fired into her driver's side window. It is inconceivable to us how anyone could commit the cowardly deeds that have left them fighting for their lives. The man they most want to talk to, her boyfriend and Panthers wide receiver Ray Carruth, so far has declined to be interviewed by police. It is our hope and belief that all the persons responsible for bringing our child and grandchild to the brink of death will be brought to justice with swiftness and certainty. The doctors had to induce a coma. For 28 days, she fought. We had to make a decision. It was a difficult decision, but it was one that I made with peace, knowing that I still had Sharika with me through Chancellor. Her legacy is living on. Her living won't be in vain, and neither will her death. Homicide investigators received information on December the 15th, 1999, that Mr. Carruth was staying in a motel. They found him hiding in the trunk of a Toyota in the motel parking lot. The trial, it was not about Sharika. It was about Ray and his lascivious lifestyle. We're not even getting the gist of why we're here. Someone has lost their life. She was looking so forward to turning 25 the plans and aspirations that she had in life and the plans that she had for the, her child were just all just snuffed out just with this heinous crime. The really wonderful thing is that Sharika kept a journal, a pregnancy journal, and she wrote down such detailed notes. There were several times in her journal she mentioned how Ray parked in a really remote area she believed someone had been in her apartment. It coincided with Van Brett Watkins' testimony about how he had taken money from Ray to shoot her. And I really say that Sharika's voice was even speaking from the grave. 
that the defendant, uh, Ray Carruth, is guilty of discharging a firearm into occupied property, guilty of using an instrument with intent to destroy an unborn child, guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, and not guilty of first-degree murder. I truly believe that forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. And sometimes I had to make that choice thousands of times a day. I pray that he comes to an acknowledgement and a repentance because God can use his life to touch so many more people. But if he never does that, and if he never asks me to forgive him, it's not about him. It's about Chancellor. Well, on the white bench, right there. Yeah. I think he's been smiling since he was born. He even had a smile then. He is so amazing. Anybody around me, if they had doubts of if there was a God and how good God is, they could see it through Chancellor. Say, hey, Mommy Angel. Hey, you boy, hey, you. He's my miracle boy. God was right in the middle of all of it because he was able to let Sharika drive that car after she'd been shot with four bullets in her. She was blowing the horn to get attention. She was able to call for help. She was able to get to the hospital to deliver this baby. She was able to live for 28 days. That was nothing but God and his angels working overtime. He says that he'll never leave us or forsake us, and he has not done that. I'm so grateful, so grateful. They didn't bury Sharika, they planted her. So she's still growing and growing and growing. It's amazing that she can smile, that you can see joy in her eyes, light in her eyes. You know, for me, when I, when I see this story, I wonder, could I do that? Could I actually forgive? Or would I be looking for revenge? Would I be looking to, how can I, can I, how can I hurt the one who hurt my daughter, who killed my daughter? And in the process of killing my daughter, deprived her unborn baby of oxygen, and in that, left him with a permanent handicap. Where do you go with that kind of thing? How, how do you do what she did? Well, there's some biblical principles here, and let's, let's sort of lay the, the foundation. And the first one, these are the words of Jesus, and it comes from Matthew chapter 6. And it's right after he's given us the Lord's Prayer. He's, he's teaching us how to pray, but he's also teaching us how to live. Here it is, Matthew 6. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then in the same gospel, in the 18th chapter, he tells this parable and he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And it's like somebody who's got a huge debt to the king. And he goes to the king and he asks for forgiveness of the debt. And the king forgives him. And then another member of that kingdom who owes that same servant a debt comes to him, says the exact same words, will you forgive me? And they're not forgiven. Uh, they're held to account for the debt that they owe. And Jesus, in this parable, says something that I find incredible. Uh, and he's, he's saying, this is the kingdom of heaven. And so when he's talking about the king, he, he's talking about principles within the kingdom. You find it in Matthew 18, verse 34 through 35. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters 
from your heart. When you hold on to un unforgiveness, you're actually torturing yourself. Every time you remember it, every time it crosses your mind, once again, you're angry, you're bitter, you, you lose out on life, you torture yourself. And, and it never gets better. It actually grows worse. The offense gets bigger over time. And, and in that process, the, the bitterness seeps in deep within your being. And you can no longer enjoy the things you used to enjoy. So Jesus, when he's talking about what happens to us, he's saying we literally are delivered over to torture. Until that point in time, we realize the only person we're hurting here is me. The person that harmed you, the person that sinned against you, they're long gone. Uh, they're not around to feel your anger. They're not around to, you know, for you to get your revenge. They're long gone. And all you're doing is harming yourself. That's why when you see Sandra and you see the light in your eyes, you go, how did you do that? Well, she tells us forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. And for her, she had to do it a thousand times a day. She said it clearly. This is what I had to do. I had to do it a thousand times a day, every day, until I got the breakthrough, until I had truly forgiven. And then she says something incredible. I hope he comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus. I hope he turns. I hope that he can be in heaven. That's amazing. And that's the forgiveness that Jesus is talking about. And when you have it, you have that same joy. You have that same gratitude. You have the same life that Sandra has. You can have that if you just forgive from your heart. And it's not a feeling. At first, it's just an act of will to say, I'm going to choose to follow what Jesus told me to do. I'm going to forgive. How many times will I forgive? He says seven times 70, I'll do that. And if I have to do that every single day, then I'll do it every single day until I get the breakthrough that I'm free from this. When I think about it, it no longer hurts me. It no longer tortures me. I can live my life in gratitude for what God has done for me. I can live in the kingdom of heaven. If you want help with this, we've got a free booklet for you. All you have to do is call us. And we'll send it to you as a PDF file. We can email it to you. Or we can send you a hard copy. It's called Forgiveness. And it gives you some principles of what you do. And in there, we encourage you to write down the offenses that you're holding on to. As they come to your mind, write them down. And then in an act of will, forgive them. Mark through them. And if you have to do it many times, do it many times. Because if that's what it takes to get free, so you're no longer tortured from it, well, that's the thing to do. All you have to do is call us. Number's toll free, 1-800-759-0700. Terry, over to you. Still ahead, a power worker falls from a rooftop and lands in heaven. I was taken into the throne room of God. It was more real than you are. It was so real and everything was just so white, whiter than white. Find out what else this man saw and heard before he came back to Earth. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Former Heisman Trophy winner and NFL quarterback Tim Tebow could be a step closer to playing professional baseball. ESPN reports the Atlanta Braves have definite interest in bringing Tebow on board, possibly for a minor league deal. 28 Major League Baseball teams, including the Braves, sent scouts to watch Tebow work out in Los Angeles. A baseball source told ESPN that representatives from five teams even talked one-on-one -on -one with Tebow after the workout. 
CBN Canada is spreading the gospel through Superbook to kids in Ontario. Volunteers, staffers, and a local Ontario church team together to present the Superbook program to over 200 children. The kids and their parents took part at the outreach event where they worshiped the Lord and watched a screening of Superbook. The kids were able to leave with their own Superbook as well as a salvation poem. 42 children committed their lives to Jesus, and that's the best news. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Gordon and Terry will be right back. Newlyweds hear it all the time. The first year of marriage will be the hardest. That was definitely true for Tom and Corinne because they spent their first year of marriage with no job and almost no money. When Tom and Corinne De Negri married in 2007, they looked to their future with anticipation and uncertainty. Because just a month before their wedding, Tom was laid off from his job in magazine sales. There was about a year and a half where there was zero income coming in, and that was, that was a struggle. It drained a lot of money. It hurt. What made it more frustrating was that Corinne, a Canadian, couldn't even take a job because her U.S. citizenship hadn't been finalized. But the couple found encouragement watching the 700 Club. We needed to hear positive things, and we needed to know that God is at work, even when it looks like things are very down. Despite living off their savings, they decided to become CBN partners. I believe in CBN. I trust them taking the money out, and then I trust them to put it to good use, to do the Lord's work. They do all of that. For months, Tom couldn't find steady work and grew frustrated as their savings dwindled. I was living in fear. I was living in anxiety. In fact, anxiety was my normal. We watched every nickel and dime we spent. We cut down everything that was not necessary. Finally, he told Corinne they needed to stop giving. That's it. We got to tighten everything up, cut all loose corners, cut all the costs, cut everything down to bare bones, including CBN, including everything. Right away, I went into prayer because that's what I know to do is to pray and to say, God, just work in Tom's heart. Let him know that you are a provider and that when we give, we inter you can intervene and be a part in this. That same day, Tom says he had a change of heart. First, he surrendered his financial situation to God. Then instead of cutting out their giving, he decided they needed to give more and went online to increase his pledge to CBN. It was a major commitment when I hit that button because I know every month $100 is being taken out. It's committed, it's done. But there was a shift going on. There was a wonderful shift that goes on because I went from being desperate and being a, a wanting to take money, now I became empowered. Even though I was still in the same situation, I was empowered to give. I was now a giver. And I was like, yes, God. <laughs> when he said, let's give, let's give more to the 700 Club, I'm like, yes. Tom says God then opened the door for a new career as a business analyst. It started when he discovered a free college course online. He took the course and landed a great paying job that turned out to be a perfect fit. As I started getting into the job, all my skills, all my job experience, they all dovetailed into this job. I never thought in my life that this would ever happen. In just a few months, Tom received three promotions with pay raises. Tom and Corinne say their decision to trust God through giving opened the door to the blessings they have today. There's only one reason, and that's because I surrendered it to God. I'm a steward, and I look back at that turning point, is that when I put my hand to give that $100, it was an act of faith. Just by that simple act of faith, God has just favored us so much. God's got such a good plan, such a great plan, and it's for our good, it's for our blessing, for our benefit. It's to keep us close to Him and to make sure that He's the top priority in our lives. And yet, even with that plan, He asks us 10%. He, we keep 90. <laughs> and part of the journey, part of the adventure He invites us to be on with Him is to reach out and touch other people, to make a difference, 
to be him with hands in the world today, touching lives, caring for people, seeing the needs of others and saying, I want to do something about that. Lots of people who understand that and get it have come together and formed the 700 Club. That's what we do. We touch lives around the world. We're a part of God's plan and you're invited to be a part of that too. If you haven't gotten on the bandwagon of giving yet, you are missing the greatest adventure of your life and we want to invite you to be a part of that today. You can join the 700 Club for 65 cents a day, $20 a month. You'll be joining thousands of others who are out to touch the lives of people who are in need, people who are desperate, people who are without hope. We want to be there for them with the love of Christ. So join us today. You can join by calling that toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700, or you can log on to CBN.com and join that way. When you do, will you do it using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. I think it's great. You don't have to have stamps or envelopes on hand. You don't have to remember to mail anything. It's all done for you, but it does save us some processing costs. So our way of saying thank you to you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every month. It's teachings that we get here as a body of Christ at CBN, and we'd like to share them with you. We think they'll be an encouragement. So call now or log in now and just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Gordon? Well, up next, a man's life hangs in the balance and his wife fears the worst. He was hooked up to a breathing machine and all kinds of machines. And I felt a lot of fear and I felt concerned. How am I going to raise three daughters by myself? Well, see how they defy the doctors and he makes an amazing comeback. Donna Moncrief was told to prepare for her husband's funeral. Rick was in a coma after a brutal fall. That was more than 18 years ago. Today, Rick is still telling the true story of his miraculous recovery and the trip he took to heaven. In September 1996, Hurricane Fran slammed into the Carolinas. In the storm's aftermath, Georgia power worker Rick Moncrief was assigned to clear downed power lines in North Carolina. He was on a rooftop trying to pull a line from under a fallen tree when the line snapped. He fell backwards and landed head first on the concrete driveway. He was flown to Duke Medical Center. His wife Donna was told to prepare for her husband's funeral. I felt a lot of fear and I felt concerned and I, I, I had this every scenario going through my brain. How am I going to raise three daughters by myself? Um, I'm too young to be a widow. You name it, those kind of thoughts came through my head. Rick had several broken ribs and his brain was hemorrhaging. Ten minutes after he arrived at the hospital, he slipped into a coma. He was hooked up to a breathing machine and all kinds of machines. And so I just, I don't, I, I just looked at him, you know, I was like, I, I was in shock, I think. I couldn't believe that he was laying there. And the doctors were just saying that it was a wait and see game. They didn't know. I believed in prayer and I knew that Jesus was the healer. In my own strength right that moment, I didn't have that, that strength in myself to pray. And so I had believers and friends who were praying for me, as well as for Rick, that we would, you know, that we would be able to come through this. The prayers continued, and by day five, Rick was still unresponsive. At least it appeared that way. I was taken into the throne room of God. It was more real than you are. It was so real, and everything was just so white, whiter than white. And I, I was on my belly, on my face before the Lord, and I saw his feet. His feet is fine burned brass. I didn't see his face. But he asked me, what do you want to do? And I kept hearing the scripture over and over, whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of the Lord or the believe the report of the doctors? And I said, I want to live. I want to live and declare the word of the Lord. And he stood up and he clapped his hands and he said, that's enough. And when he said, that's enough, I began immediately to come out of the coma. His doctor said Rick would never be the same again. Rick and Donna believed differently. She said, well, you're the most luckiest person in the world now that you ever came out of this coma and you recover from this fall a little bit, but it'll be 60 months minimum, which is five years, before you will ever be 40% back. 
and I told her. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I don't mean any disrespect at all to you, but I said, it's not going to take that long. The Lord's going to do a quick work. During rehab, Rick says he read Psalms in the Bible, and he and Donna joined their friends and family in prayer. I was believing for the healing, and my friends were believing for the healing, because we believed by his stripes we are healed. Each day, his health improved, and after just 27 days of rehab, Rick had a 95% recovery. When I came back to work at the power company in the early part of 1997, I came back to work full duty. The faithfulness of God comes to my mind, that our God, at the, at the immediate cry of our heart, will hear us, and He listens, and He's faithful. The great doctors at, at these two great hospitals did all they could do, but it was the Father's love. It was His grace. It was His compassion on me to allow me to live today and, and live these 18 years since this has happened. Rick later retired from the power company and became a pastor. He cherishes every moment he has with his wife and family and says he doesn't let a day go by without giving thanks to God for his miraculous healing. Every day is an incredible day. Every day is just, there's always a lot to be thankful for. I'm just thankful that I feel better today than I did yesterday. I'm thankful today that I'm able to stand up. I'm thankful today I don't have a, a massive headache this morning. I'm thankful today that I'm able to breathe by myself without a machine. I'm just thankful. An experience like that does that for you. You begin to realize all the blessings you have. Well, God is in the miracle working business, and not just for this man and his family, but for you as well. And we know there are many of you who have prayer needs, and we want to pray for you in a moment. But first, we want to further encourage your faith by sharing some other reports. You've got one, Gordon. I've got one from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Bob had lifted 380 pounds. He strained his back and his disc deteriorated. On a scale of 1 to 10, his pain was 15. Then in January, he watched the 700 Club. Terry, you said there's someone with a disc in your back that's out of order and it's painful, so painful. God is healing that for you right now. That terrible shooting pain is just going to be gone. That deep aching, gone. And then I said there's someone you've got deteriorating bone in the vertebra of your back and you just live in constant pain. God's healing you. He's restoring you. He's giving you new bone. He's able to straighten everything and bring it all into alignment now in Jesus' name. Well, Bob heard all that, and he's had no pain since, and he's wow. praising God for a miracle. I bet he is. Yeah. Well, here's, here's another miracle. This is Ruth. She lives in Westminster, California. She was diagnosed with COPD. Her lungs were so bad, she only had a 15% capacity. When she spoke, she said it sounded like the croaking of a frog. She was required to be on oxygen 24 hours a day, wasn't even able to go outdoors. Her doctor had placed her on a waiting list for a lung transplant. Then last month, she was watching this program, and Gordon, she heard you give this word. You have COPD in both lungs. It's like a pile of bricks on your chest, and it's very difficult to breathe. God just released it. Take that deep breath now. Realize you've been healed and have been made whole. That same hour, both Ruth's breath and her voice returned to her. Wow. Praise God. That's a miracle. Doctors will tell you, COPD, there's no cure. Doctors will tell you for that kind of back pain, there's no cure. When the bones in the vertebra start to deteriorate, when, when discs get out of alignment, they say there's no cure. You know, they, they sometimes talk about surgery, but they don't guarantee any results. I know someone who can guarantee results. His name is God Almighty. And with him, nothing is impossible. So encourage yourself by thinking, well, how, how big is it possible? How big is that? How, how wide is that? How deep is that? Because if nothing is impossible, then that means all things are possible to them that believe. Now, how do you get there? How do you get to that point when you can actually believe? And I know how, uh, it's really hard when you're in a hospital bed and you're on the ventilator and you've got machines, you've got tubes, you've got all these things going on. 
And you can hear that machine, it's, it's real regular. You hear that heart monitor, it's real regular. And how do you pray through? How do you get to that point where you can believe the report of the Lord? Well, you just heard it from Rick, how he got there. He got there through Thanksgiving. He started thanking God for, for, for breath. He started thanking God for the, all the things he could think of. Don't thank him for the illness. He's not the author of that. Don't thank him for that. But thank him for Jesus. Thank him for the cross. Thank him for by his stripes you are healed. Thank him for that. And when you get so full of praise, you find that he gets enthroned in that. His presence comes down. And all these other things fade away. You literally come into the throne room of God, just as Rick did. And you get to hear his voice. You get to sense his presence. And in that place, all things are possible. So Terry and I are going to pray with you. We're going to agree. And Jesus said these words. If two or more agree, touching anything, some translations say concerning anything, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. So we're going to agree in an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. If it's throughout your body, lay your hands on your head. If there are people around you, ask them to come and pray. And let's just believe and let's thank him for life. Let's thank him for Jesus. And let's believe that all things are possible. Let's pray. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you. And as people are laying hands mm -hmm. on that area of the body that needs healing, as loved ones are coming around them and laying hands on their bodies now, we come into agreement with them and we declare over them all things are possible. And we praise you now. We thank you for life, for breath, the breath that you gave us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that by his stripes we are healed. We were healed. And we ask that your presence would just invade and be in their bodies, be all around them, fill the room with your glory, Lord. And we agree and we say out loud, be healed in Jesus' name. There's someone you've got uh, serious kidney conditions uh, and uh, it's very painful, particularly in your right kidney. And God is healing you right now. He's restoring kidney function. He's taking away cancer right now in Jesus' name. Receive it. Believe it. It's for you. Believe it now. Terry? And someone with tremendous joint pain. God is healing that. You're just going to feel a warmth come over your joints and it's gone. Be set free in Jesus' name. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. If you've been touched, we want to share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. We leave you this word from James. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed.